Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. And I bet you're exposed to investment risks right now. To reduce it, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and download the risk reduction checklist I've made specifically for you, my podcast listeners, based on the lessons I've learned from all of my guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest Ian Moyes. Ian, are you ready to rock? I certainly am. And hopefully I'm not the worst podcast guest. To your oh, voice. you definitely won't be. <laughs> I was once a guest on my own show. So you're safe. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me just tell the audience a little bit about you. Ian is Chief Revenue Officer at 1UP Sales and has sat on the boards of a number of industry bodies such as the Federation Against Software Theft, Cloud Industry Forum, EuroCloud. He was awarded the accolade of BESMA UK Sales Director of the Year and was listed in the top 50 sales keynote speakers by the top sales world. Ian was rated number one cloud influencer on Alitica and has been recognized as a leading cloud blogger and is used, utilized by a range of global brands as a cloud computing thought leader. My goodness, Ian, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. I wonder, how, when I hear it, I always think, now I know why I've got no time. It makes it feels that right. So yeah, so I, I all of that stuff, I think I've been uh, lucky in some things that opportunity has presented itself through... Uh, putting myself out there so I volunteer for a lot of things such as this and thank you for taking the opportunity to speak with me um, and I think by putting yourself out there and giving back opportunity also comes to you so there's a nugget of advice mm. I, start, I started writing blogs and doing bits and pieces years ago as part of the day job and then started to get asked could you do this could you do that uh, you know I volunteered for school speaking and slowly I got more adept at writing content or speaking and I've become this influencer for five or six major global brands in the cloud computing area. And if you'd said to me 10 years ago that would happen or what would you do to achieve that? I'd say I wouldn't even know where to start. So there's lots of accidents, but probably created by giving back uh, and, and making effort, trying hard and doing the right st stuff in your day job and, and just stretching yourself, putting yourself out there to stuff that you wouldn't normally do and, I, and, and I've, su I've suggested this to others and seen them suddenly find the same we've all got expertise we've all got an experience give something back it's a great point and i i have a little story i want to share about that from my experience i was a president of cfa society for chartered financial analysts here in thailand and it's a voluntary you know organization and you know we have about 500 members and nobody has time, you know, so everybody's super busy. So it's very hard to corral people together to help do events or whatever. But there was a young guy and his name was Note. His nickname was Note. And Note basically said, hey, I'll volunteer to, you know, get involved. And he helped with what we called the CFA Research Challenge. And he did a great job and all that. And I didn't even realize that he hadn't actually passed the CFA. He hadn't gotten the CFA designation. He had passed level three of the three exams. And then when I learned that, I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive, you know, like just to, to, to volunteer before you were like officially a CFA charter holder. <clears throat> and it's a lesson I always tell people, because um, if you if you're, tr you know, trying to get into an organization like that, sometimes you can get in pretty easily. And in those types of organizations, you got a lot of high powered people, but they don't have a lot of time. So you can get involved and the people that are leading it are leaders in the industry. So no spend time with myself and others. And then. Then he got his CFA charter and he came to see me. He says, I want to be on the board. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, I mean, he's, he's young, but he demonstrated his willingness to work on the projects that we had. And that was really a criteria for getting on the board. So he ended up being a relatively young guy getting on the board and he's contributed tremendously. So I think the lesson I was thinking about, you know, when we're older, let's say we have expertise to give and all that. But when you're younger, you may not have as much expertise, but give a little time. Yeah. And, and, that, and, and I've always said, it, you know, a lot of people I talk to is talk about they want to earn more money or do such and such. So, well, do, do, do work harder now. Do this, do this. Well, no, I'm not doing that until they pay me. Well, you won't get it then. Those are the people who never get it. 
what I've always done is worked as though I'm already doing the job or earning the salary I want to have, behave that way now. And what I've learned, in, inevitably it comes to you. People spot what you're doing. That's how I got my first promotion was by working incredibly harder than I needed to. And then went so that when an opportunity came for a more senior role, they had no choice but to at least consider me, if not give it to me, because I'm already doing it. I'm already proving it. How can you not consider me? Not, I'd like to be considered. I could do it. I've, I've shown you. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, the pe people, leaders in businesses want to pay people to do those jobs. And if you can show that you can do it, you know, I mean, obviously there's some cheaters out there, but generally there's people just want to pay because they want that job done. So great advice. All right. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah, sure. So it's a slightly different one than, than a money investment, although uh, I guess we've all had different things where we failed there. So I thought about this and I thought, what, what's the biggest thing we all have that we invest that can be wasted and, and you can't get more of, and it's time. So the biggest investment I made was a, a, a choice, which I'll cover in a second, which wasted a, a whole bunch of my time. Now you could argue I learned from it, so we'll talk about what, what the positives were, I guess, at the end. But I chose uh, a number of years ago, not so far back, but, but not, not re too recently. Um, I was in the unfortunate circumstance of being between jobs. I've been in a number of businesses that have been acquired or there's been redundancies, et cetera. And right now, I'm sure there are a lot of people listening who can recognize this problem, either themselves or with friends and family. COVID has called, had a devastating effect on a lot of people's lives through no fault of their own in terms of they've been furloughed or they've lost their role. And I've spoken to many people in that situation because they're just in the wrong sector or in the wrong company that's been affected by what's happened. So I was in that situation, so you need a job. When you need a job, there's a, you have a different window, depending on your financial circumstance, you'll have a different window of at what point do you, does it become a necessity? It might be, oh, I could last three or four months. I can, others might be, I need something immediately because I can only just cover my bills. We all have different situations at different periods of our life. So I had a, a little bit of a window but what you don't want to do is be out there too long looking and all this. So I was interviewing and needed a job and uh, found an opportunity which looked perfect for me. I, I, I thrive in smaller businesses and helping them grow. It's exactly what I'm doing now. I've done it five or six times very successfully, uh, helping them accelerate into a, a growth position and become a bigger firm. So it looked ideal. And I'm not going to name names to protect the innocent, but um, met with the founders, met, met with all the key people, and it was a family business. And it looked at face value like this is great. I'm getting on with them. The rapport's good. And th this could be the step. I, and they needed someone to come in and reignite a business that had been stagnant on revenue for a number of years. So I took the role, needed a job, took the role. Um, and in the end, I was there nine months. So I built a team, recruited people in to be around me. So I'm now involving other people's decisions, important decisions in their life, right? Where they're mm. working, their, their work life. Uh, built a team of about nine people. Um, and that's at the point we started to realize there was some cracks in this, in that there was um, dysfunction in the family. There was incredible politics for a small company that meant you couldn't change things. So my job was to fix this piece. So my job, what I'm good at doing, but that involves change. That involves assimilating a situation and then changing things. If, if you keep doing the same thing, the old adage, keep doing the same thing, don't expect to get different results. And as soon as I wanted to change things, you can't change that. So that was so-and-so's idea. Well, you can't change it. We don't think that needs changing. Well, that needs some money to change it. Yeah, we're not doing that. Okay. And then it became also emotional and political in that the family uh, and, and the culture in the business was quite toxic. So I've now not only put myself in this situation, but I've brought other people into it, good people, mm. which I felt responsible for. So my style of management is... Um, 
or servant leader where I have duty of care to my employees to help them be successful and also to protect them in the environment they're in that they can, uh, you know, I always look, look at earning, earning and learning. I, my job is to help them be successful and earn money, to learn and develop their own skill set and their career. And the yearning is enjoy coming to work. Yeah, you'll have mm. a bad day, but be in an environment where you want to be and you want to work harder through not being told to because you genuinely invest because you're enjoying it and you believe. And that was something I couldn't support there. So, you know, what's the mistake I've made in this investment of, of my time and, and all these other people was I had not done enough diligence on making the decision to invest in this, in, in this job, in this selection. And the learning exercise, I think, is when you're in a position of you're in a job, you might do more, you're more, you can be more choosy. I think when you're in a position of you need a job, you can get excited, you can get blinkered at the at what's out there, right? So these people really want you, they, they, it sounds great. Did I do enough diligence? Did I do enough research to qualify out and say, actually, I'm going to turn it down? That's a harder decision to make when you're not <laughs> in a job, right? And that's the position a lot of people are going to be in right now of... Um, it, at face value, it looks great and I need a job. Oh, thank God I've got a job. I've got a job offer. Is how hard is it to, to, to look below the surface? How hard is it to see the negatives of something when you're so elated, when you so needed that and it's a lifeline? Mm. And I think that's the big learning lesson is think very carefully about a role you're going to take because I, I know people may need the money and, and will put up with things and, and sometimes necessity will overtake that but what you don't want to do is be in a toxic environment which will affect your mental health which will affect the people around you your your hope you know your a job is a big part of your, your life obviously and put you in a position where you need to look for another job and I think there's a big danger coming out of covid and I had to make a, a conscious decision to leave there so soon. And a lot of my team did. So a, a lot of us exited in less than a year. Mm. You then have a difficult position to explain to the next employer, why didn't you stay there very long? Mm. Right. So you've got to, that, that, there's that tipping point of, you don't want to be a job hopper. You don't want a negative on your CV. But likewise, I don't want to be here. Mm. Now, if I'd made, you know, with hindsight, would I have looked more carefully at other opportunities I had? Would I have worked harder on others I'd had? And would I have just turned this one down regardless? Could I have found this out beforehand? You know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. I don't know the answers to those things now. Mm, mm, mm. But, but I regret having accepted that job and having had that toxicity of experience. The only positive I look at is I learned from it that I can talk about this story now and think, okay, what do I look for in the future because of what I've been through? Yeah. So maybe I'll uh, summarize some things I take away um, from your story. I think the, the first thing is that what I call it in this, the world of startup, but also it's in this, you know, um, you know, when you're looking for a job, I call it chasing revenue. And in many startups, you know, you, you think, okay, I'm gonna, we're going to knock it out of the park and everybody's going to line up to buy our product or service or software or whatever, but, and then nobody shows up and you think, okay, what can we do to bring money into the door now? <laughs> and, and, and then you find yourself yeah. jumping from this to that, this, to that. And, you know, if you're lucky, you survive through that point and then you regroup and then you refocus on what you think is the core. But you do have this time where you're chasing revenue. And I think the thing that I take away from your story is realize your vulnerability at that time. And when you realize that you're vulnerable, use that as a tool to kind of put a little bit more thought into what you're committing to, maybe putting in a little bit more effort than you normally would because you know you're vulnerable and you're in a position where you could be willing to overlook something and to not even do the due diligence because I just, I can't afford it. And, you know, I, I will also say after um, going through all of my episodes and all of my stories that have been submitted to me and told to me, 
I can tell you that there's six common mistakes and the number one most common mistake is failed to do their research and hear the due diligence aspect of it. And I think, yep. you know, my question that I had in my mind as you were talking is, it, did you not do your due diligence or you decided I can't afford to do due diligence? I've got to take this. I, I think I was blink, I, I, and I think Andrew, it's interesting you, you highlight it in that way of the six points. And do you know what my job and what I've worked with people on is qualifying customers. Qualifying, are we the right fit to bring value to them that uh, they'll, they'll get long term success with us? Um, and their qualification is a key part of it. But I think you can get blinkered. And I think the way you've said that makes me think salespeople get blinkered when it's the golden deal they want. You know, my job as a sales leader is to question them is, well, why, is it, why are we going to win this? Why is it right for the customer? Um, often people get blinkered because. Not be, I think not because they don't want to know, but they're so enthusiastic, they're so focused on the outcome. They hit, I'm get, oh, I've got a job, I've, I've got a job offer, or they want me, or the customer's going to buy. Mm. They don't want to ask the other questions subconsciously because it might expose something that takes away this success feeling, right? Oh, we're going to win this. Sales people, we're going to win this. And then I go, what about this, 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 and this? And then we don't know the answer. The big risk here, it's not. It's not the 90% chance you think it is, but that's good. Let's now go and look at those things. It might be 90%, but you, you're you assuming it is. You're not doing it based on full diligence. Mm. If we do the full diligence, we might still be in the same position, but we know then why we're in that position as opposed to assuming it. And I think you're absolutely right. I didn't do my diligence, not because I consciously chose not to, because subconsciously, Oh, thank God for that. I've got a job. I feel like I can do it. it. The, headline, the headline stuff makes me blinker myself. Yep. Yep. And it's interesting too, in the, in the realm of sales, like for anybody that's had to return a product, return a service, you know, refund money and, and realize, okay, this really wasn't right for that customer. It really, you know, what, what you're talking about is the idea that, you know, there's nothing better than selling a solution for a customer and they really appreciate it. And, you know, from a sales perspective, if you show that commitment to them and, and, then, and then you walk away and you say, look, I just think this is probably not right for you at this moment yeah. in time, they're going to they're gonna trust you more. And when that moment in time comes, who are they going to call? They're going to call you. Yeah. So a salesperson's job is, is not to sell. It's a difficult one when you think about it. It is to sell things, but it's not to sell things to the wrong customer it's to put the, the prospective customer in a safe environment where they trust that you're going to sell them the right thing at the right time. And no product or service is the right is right for every prospective customer every time when it, for, for every situation. So there's got to be some you walk away from. Mm. It's got, you cannot have this adage of, I want to win everything, right? No, you should want to win everything where the customer will get value from what you're selling them, therefore you should want to win those ones where it's the right fit. Where it's not, don't waste each other's time. A lot of lessons there. All right, so based upon what you learned from this story, and I want to frame this question by thinking of that young man or woman out there who is struggling right now. They are looking for a job. They've gotten a job offer. We know they're vulnerable. They know they're vulnerable. They're listening to this podcast. What, what one action? would you recommend they do to avoid suffering the same fate? So I think do, do more, more diligence than you would normally do. And the beauty is that there's more opportunity to do it than ever before because of the web. 20 years ago, it, it was really hard. Now you can, so here's some quick, quick things, actions I would mm. take. Check online who you're connected with. LinkedIn's a beautiful tool for that. Who are you connected with that might have a connection with that business? Who knows someone um, through some connection? It might give you some context. Well, who used to work there? Oh my gosh, Jeff, I used to work with, or it's Sue that, except I, I used to get a cut. Whatever, know someone there or used to work there. Get some context. Number one, look at Glassdoor, but take it with a pinch of salt. Glassdoor is a um, often for large organizations, but employees write reviews on there. And it's like anything like Amazon, there's good and bad at any company, but just look for the trends in that. Look online for customer reviews. There's 
if it's a technology product, there are sites like G2 Cloud, there are sites like, um, uh, the, there's a Gartner one, Gart, um, I think it's called Insights, but where you can look, type the company or product name in and put reviews, whatever mm. industry, and they might often they'll come up, there's a, yeah. at Terra, there's a review site, and there'll be customer reviews. How does that, how does that look? There's so much rich insight you can get rather than going just to their website. Have a look at their employees. If it's a smaller business, how long have employees been there? And in the process, here's an easy one. In the process, have you ever asked them, I really like the look of this firm. I want to be the right fit for you and vice versa. Can I speak to one of the team members that I've worked with? Can I speak to someone who isn't in the hiring process? At our company right, right, right now, if I'm Andrew, one up, what we do is, and I've got two people going through this today, in, in, incidentally, who may join my team. I've got them talking to other members of the company, not in the hiring process, but who are just in other departments, are jumping mm. on a call to get a culture fit, not just for us, but for the individual. And I've said, you can ask them anything you like. They've been here several years. What's it like to work there? What's it like? What, any question you want to ask them, you're talking to other people in the business is who you'd work with to find out whether you, and it gives you that feel. And if the business refuses that, that might be a signal in itself. Why won't they let you talk to people? Why mm. won't they let you talk to the other person, someone else in the accounts team or someone else in the support team or in sales that you're going to work with to just have a chat, not an interview. You just want to talk to them about what's the company like? Why did you join? I can see you've been there three years. What do you like? What's your, what's your bugbears? What's your niggles? And let them be transparent. Let them tell them the system's a bit clunky and things take a bit longer. And it, because they're going to find out when they join anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. That would be my suggestion. That's a great suggestion. And, you know, for the listeners out there, you know, you go and interview with a company and they feel comfortable saying, well, I'd like you to meet with some more staff, you know, if they're able and, you know, they want to do that. And then there's nothing wrong with you saying, you know, and you requesting that. So I think that's really great and it's actionable advice. So last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? So I guess, uh, I mean, I, I, there's so many things I've got to do in the, in the business I'm in, uh, we've got a really exciting time, but let me, let me, let me pick this one if I may, because I think this one gets overlooked and it's for the last 12 months and for the 12 months after is always be learning. I think people, they get to a position, and I'm in a senior role in a senior position. I've hired some young people recently, and I said to them, I've got a lot of experience, I can mentor you and help you, etc. but I'm also going to learn from you. Because you've been through a different journey and a different experience than I have. Um, so I still learn from the people around me. And take this context, what I learned 10, 15 years ago might not be relevant anymore. Right, the world's mm. changed. The bio's changed. We've got an age of the internet. We've got COVID um, disrupted and made bi businesses pivot and processes pivot. So we live in a changing world. So my thing is always be learning and be willing to take on new ideas and learn. Not just because you've done it ten times before, it's right the eleventh time. Someone else who hasn't got as much experience as you and isn't as blinkered as you into this repeated mode may come up with something that rocks your world and changes it and be prepared to change and change again the <clears> world is going to be more though that you know if you anyone that interviews with me and, and demonstrates that they've had to adapt and change and they and they're still learning and they're still enthusiastic about learning things well aren't you attracted to that type of person because <laughs> um they're going to, you're going to change things in your business are going to change right yeah so i want someone who's adept to change not someone who's everything's got to be the same way all the time those are two values that intrinsically are going to have more value, say it again. But as mm. we move forward, if you can demonstrate your ability to continually learn and adapt, you are going to be more valuable as an employee to organizations as we move forward. And, that, and it's, that's it's what a I great, thrive on. So, yeah. It's a great reminder. And I'm going, to, I'm going to pull up something here on the video. So for the listeners, you won't be able to see it, but I'll tell you, I'm reaching, you know, you can see already behind my desk is a lot of, books but i'm going to reach over on my desk here and get something and it's a stack of books that i've been reading related to sales and there you go without moving <laughs> yeah and these are some of the books i've been reading and you know i'm i am a i'm a finance guy so 
I don't know anything about sales. So, you know, I want to learn. And recently I started a, I do a, I do a one hour webinar called don't read these 36 books on goal setting because I've already read them for you. Really? And I, and I, they're books that I've read over the years, but also I've had to kind of refresh my mind, but what a, just the idea of creating that act, you know, creating that one hour content is, you know, valuable. So I think this is also very valuable advice. And that the great is great thing is that, that here's the problem though. The people listening to this probably already are in that mode because they're listening to this. It's the people that need to hear this message are the people that aren't listening to um, podcasts, webinars, etc., because they think they know it all. And invariably, that's their fault, right? They don't know it all. They think they're the smartest person in the room. Mm. Well, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room because everyone's learning from you and you're getting no value. So listen up, ladies and gentlemen, and grab a friend and bring them in. Well, listeners, there you have it, another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, to reduce risk in your life. So go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and download the risk reduction checklist and see how you measure up. As we conclude, Ian, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? I, I, I think just good luck for the year ahead. And no matter what situation you're in, be positive. I know it's not always easy. Work. I've always thought you can, you can graft your way out of anything. So if, if it isn't good around you, work hard. And getting a job is a job in itself. Mm -hmm. Treat it. So that's what I did. Um, and that's my biggest advice for someone looking for a job is work extremely hard at it like that is your job you're being paid to do. And it will pay dividends. Beautiful. Well, that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.